Okay, let's get started. Today we are starting chapter 12, which is moral development. And uh, we will um, start this chapter today, finish it on Wednesday. Um, we will engage in an in-class activity on Wednesday. Uh, and then next Monday, there is no class because it's a national holiday. I will send out an email about what to do. And so moral development is very interesting because um, how we perceive morality, what's moral and what's not moral, affects what we feel, how we think, and how we behave, right? And so um, there have been different theories that aim to uh, explain how morality develops. These could be grouped as biological theories, psychoanalytic theories, social learning theory, behaviorist theory, and cognitive developmental. In this chapter, we will go through each one of them and discuss them. Um, today, we're going to hopefully finish uh, psychoanalytic theory and stop here. Now, uh, the theories that believe uh, moral development has evolutionary roots and uh, has um, a genetic heritage claim that we are born a certain way or quickly after birth, we are predisposed to learn about what is good and what is bad. And it has survival value uh, in the sense that it actually fosters bonds that we have with significant people in our immediate groups, which would be our families. Uh, and it fosters empathy, caring, and when the situation calls for it, self-sacrifice. And now this is within a, a family setting. Uh, however, uh, we are not um, beings that only care for family. Our moral codes do not only apply to our sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, aunts and uncles. We actually feel strongly uh, for others who are not related to us. And evolutionary theory also then tells us that uh, it is possible that it was an evolutionary achievement for human beings to start feeling empathy, caring, and applying the moral code to people who were they were not immediately related to. Because human beings survived in groups. And the ability to form uh, give and take relations, reciprocity, cooperation within groups was also important for our survival. Um, so there is an evolutionary way of thinking that suggests natural selection fostered altruism. Uh, and we have pre-wired emotional reactions, meaning certain parts of our brain are actually um, more active in processing moral problems. And these seem to be um, more or less the same areas from one person to the next, which again suggests that there might be some structural foundation for moral reasoning. Mirror neuron systems and work done on mirror neuron systems that, for example, suggest that when we see somebody in pain, the areas of our brain that are active when we experience pain are also activated, which again seems to suggest that there is some neural foundation for our feelings of care and compassion for others. Now, how many of you, I wonder, I just want to see hands, think that babies are born with a predisposition to know what's morally right from what's morally wrong? One person. Okay, I'm going to ask this question again after we watch the video. You won't feel bad about yourself, Ebrard. And so let's watch the video. This is a lengthy video, but from time to time I might stop and uh, chat with you a little bit. It is very intriguing.
though a very different line of research, one that also um, Jed does, uh, John Su, uh, the graduate student John Su Sumer does with Jed, uh, is basically also looking at children's selective imitation. Uh, so this has nothing to do with it, but it's uh, going to make a very similar point. So what they do is they show a child a box that they have created. Uh, and this box opens a certain way. In order to open the box, uh, you need to maybe uh, take out a, um, a stick uh, that is holding the door closed and also um, open the door via a latch. And so there are only two steps that they need to do in order to open the box. But children are shown uh, an experimenter modeling how to open the box in different ways. Uh, and in one, uh, there are these unnecessary steps that the person puts. For example, the person takes out the stick that I talked about, but then taps on the box three times, like tap, 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 and then does other unnecessary stuff, and then opens the latch, and so the box is open. Now, you would think that children, as we get older, we get more rational, we get faster on our feet, and we find the most effective solution fast and implement that. What's interesting with this research is that children, as they get older, are more likely to carry out the unnecessary steps. Younger children discard the unnecessary steps and just pull out the pin and unlatch the door. That's, that's what they usually do. But as children get older, they start doing these unnecessary tapping motions and stuff. What is it? Monkeys also go for the more rational, more effective, faster choice too. The idea is that as children are getting older, they are learning to learn from culture. And they're learning to learn from people. And even in cases where they understand that an action has nothing to do with the causal consequence, if that is how it is done, then they are going to do it as such, as a member of a culture. So as children are getting older, they might actually be, be becoming a little bit more inefficient in order to accommodate culture. I mean, there are many things that we do that aren't the most efficient ways of doing things. How many of you have ever done made Turkish coffee here before? I, I assume everybody, yes, yes. There are things that we do, there are things that we believe to get that best foam on the coffee. And usually they don't work for some reason. You, and there's a way, the purse put the coffee, the, the water has to be cold, you pour the coffee, you don't stir too much, you know, this, that. And some of them, I, I believe, are like just urban myths because they do not contribute to that foam. But however we have been thought, taught to make the coffee, we basically carry out all those steps. Some of them we know aren't actually, you know, providing the results that we think that it should. And it's because that's our learning of um, how in this culture this coffee is made. And so uh, it is a very interesting way of looking at it, but I think the last research gave a twist I very much do appreciate that uh, comment, I think of Nije, is it, who, who, uh, about the socially desirable answering. Okay. Psychoanalytic theory and the role of guilt. Here comes Freud with all of the guilt that is associated to childhood. As you know, Freud believed that in early childhood, children experience either Oedipus or Electra conflicts, depending on their gender. Meaning, they want the opposite gender parent for themselves, and they actually actively have a dislike for the same-sex parent. However, they do understand that they're not going to get rid of the same-sex parent, uh, and that these feelings are wrong, and so they start feeling guilt. The hostility they feel towards that same-sex parent is then directed towards the self, uh, and it becomes guilt. And this then, because they feel this guilt, then they over-identify with the same-sex parent, internalizing their moral attitudes. 
Yes. Uh, according to Freud, what drives moral development is fear of punishment and loss of parental love. Uh, but modern researchers disagree uh, because children seem to experience guilt as a result of their own improper actions more than their feelings towards uh, the other sex parent. Uh, and also parental attitudes affect guilt formation. And we also see that those parents who are a bit abusive, withdraw love, uh, or neglect their children, actually have children who feel guilt less. And so it doesn't seem like this loss of parental love is what's driving children's feelings of guilt, hence, again, driving their morality to develop. An alternative explanation to this is inductive discipline. It's a form of positive discipline which helps children notice others' feelings, point out the effects of children's own misbehavior on other people, uh, and note others' distress, uh, making clear that the child caused the distress, and this is also known as empathy-based guilt. So a parent who uses induction, if, for example, their kid knocked down uh, a castle uh, that another child built out of sand in the sandbox in the playground, might be like, see, işte, um, I ran out of uh, uh, names. Uh, I'll go to my uh, trusted one, Bakchan. See, Bakchan, uh, does anybody know a Bakchan, by the way? You do, okay. Um, I have a stereotype of a Bakchan. <laughs> I should. <laughs> You're right, okay. <laughs> so, um, sometimes I forget we're being videotaped. What if a Bakchan watches this? This is a problem. <laughs> yes. And so, anyways, but here in this scenario, a back John's castle is knocked down uh, by Omar, Omar's mother, basically, if she says, look, you knock down back John's castle, you see how sad he is, he's crying, and he's crying because his castle is gone, and it's because of you, because you knocked it down. What can we do to help him? So this kind of inductive uh, discipline uh, actually helps children to empathize with others better, and also show more prosocial behavior, meaning for behavior that actually aims to help others. Uh, this is a good way to induce empathy because it actually is very educational in a way. It uh, informs the child on how to behave, what's the appropriate type of behavior, promotes empathy and sympathetic concern, uh, paves the way for prosocial behavior. What can we do to make back John happy? makes the connection between behavior and emotions clear for children. Uh, because children aren't actually experts in understanding this at all, as we saw in theory of mind <coughs> development as well. Uh, it helps develop scripts for moral and immoral behavior, uh, complete with feelings and strategies to get out of negative feelings. And children and adolescents who view discipline as fair are more likely to both listen to this kind of discipline and internalize it too. Um, there are child factors in inductive discipline, so it's not a prescription for all, it's not a recipe for all, because we know that children are different, they show individual differences from very early ages. There are temperamental differences, for example. We talked about fearful children, we talked about um, uh, more irritable children, more impulsive children. And so um, those children who are naturally empathic uh, require less power assertion by their parents. So it's more subtle um, um, warnings, explanations actually help these children uh, and they don't require uh, big statements. Anxious children, again, uh, ha mild and patient tactics work best. For fearless children, um, firm tactics should be in place, but it should always be nested in the context of warm parent-child relationships. Uh, yes. Okay, I, it seems like I, I didn't change it. So I actually post these slides twice this morning because I realized that this slide is out of place. 
Um, so it actually needs to come right after here, like it should be the 11th slide after this. So I'm going to move on and come back to it. So how is induction different than Freud's theory? In Freud's theory, we are concerned with guilt. Guilt because the child feels feelings towards the other sex parent, which then translates into guilt. However, in induction, the child will still feel guilty or learn to feel guilty, but this is an empathy-based guilt. They'll feel guilty because they have hurt somebody else, and this is quite different. Another theory that actually looks at the development of morality is social learning theory. In this theory, morality is learned through reinforcement and modeling. So culture does a lot to teach children. And um, this is, in this theory, it is acknowledged that um, it is quite impossible for all children to learn by conditioning because the amount of experience that are in the world may not be as varied to allow for that. But children also learn through watching others' behavior as well. Um, and here in this context, helpful models increase children's pro-social responses. So if they're looking at adults who are good models of moral behavior, they will actually internalize these. And what is a helpful model? I'm going back here. Uh, good models uh, are warm and responsive. So these are not people that the children are unfamiliar with, but have good bonds with, right? They want to imitate these people. They want to learn from these people. These people show competence and power, uh, so they're competent people, most like adults. All adults are actually competent and powerful as compared to children. But they also have consistency between what they say and what they do, right? Uh, and so uh, if they're going to teach their children not to throw litter on the floor, on the ground, outside, they won't engage in that behavior themselves either. So punishment. Um, in this social learning theory, obviously, punishment plays a role. Uh, is punishment a effective way of children, teaching children what's right and what's wrong? Uh, partial answer, yes. Partial answer, no. Well, what do we mean by punishment is also very important. Do we mean corporal punishment? Corporal punishment would be a physical form of punishment. But please do not, when we say corporal punishment, we don't usually mean beating a child senseless. Corporal punishment is, does anybody not speak Turkish in this classroom at this moment? Corporal punishment is mostly poposuna poposuna vurmak. It is not hitting the child in the head. It is not like hair pulling. Like that actually gets to a different realm. You know, it's, it, the corporal punishment is inflicting mild pain to get the child's attention. Uh, and um, other alternatives to punishment are, as you know, timeout. Does any, everybody know what timeout is? Yes, letting the child sit out and think about what they did wrong. Withdrawing privileges, like you won't be able to have the dessert if. Uh, and positive discipline. Um, now, um, the effectiveness of punishment is greatly increased by how consistent it is. So if a parent punishes a behavior twice out of the five times it occurs, it is quite unlikely that the child will internalize that. Warm parent-child relationships and explanations of why the punishment is happening. Okay. Wait. Okay, I will stop right here and meet with you on Wednesday.